Thank you. So, um, yes, and I'll say maybe not the bread and butter of all psychologists, but in terms of, of my uh, theoretical orientation, all that crazy boring stuff, either way, it is, yes, it is definitely something that I'm excited to chat about. So let me switch over here um, and share. I, I've created a little PowerPoint. So let me do that real quick. And for those of you that are just calling in um, or can't see, don't worry, this may be uh, being recorded. Ah, here we go. So just another second here. All right. So let me start this up. All right, freedom from frustration, uh, from you know, being irritable, being upset at night, but also we're really gonna dive into all of these different mindsets which often impact being able to fall asleep, stay asleep, all that good stuff. So again, um, definitely appreciate if uh, everybody could kind of hold their, their questions till the end, I'd be happy to to take them then. So let's start off with this. Is our mind a friend or a foe? Probably both, honestly. Um, but if you are tuning into this, this webinar, it may be more on the foe side. So again, a, one, a wonderful ally or it can be kind of a problem child. It is good that our mind works, right? We do not want the opposite. There's only one time that our mind does not work at all, for the most part. That is when we are not alive. So in and of itself, the mind being awake, alert, is good. But it is when it becomes too stimulated, or when we're worrying, or anxious, or frustrated, or irritable, all that kind of stuff, then that's when it's more so our foe. So um, you know, during the day, we process information. In different ways right so this is this is kind of what Lori was talking about in terms of um, when she's saying it's kind of my bread and butter this is so my theoretical orientation is something called cognitive behavioral um, therapy and actually one of the things that I do at Valley Sleep is cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia but cognitive behavioral therapy CBT is really focusing on how the mind impacts the body how the mind impacts our emotions, how our mind impacts our, our physiological being. So I won't get into all of that kind of stuff, but there is one important lesson to learn right off the bat that, you know, a lot of times what we think is not necessarily true. And unless we're aware of what we are thinking, then it can kind of be on autopilot and we can be impacted by what we're thinking in ways that we don't know. So for example, one of these ways is thinking about work, right? So this is kind of a classic example. I was just working with someone um, on, on this very thing where every Sunday night, they start to feel a little bit anxious. They don't even know why. And then, oh, we make this connection, right? So again, it's being in a place where we are processing information differently to have a different result. So. Um, when we're getting ready for sleep, we want to feel relaxed and calm, right? That's not news to anybody. But it's the ways that we can get out ahead of ourselves that sometimes are a little eye-opening for people. So the ways that we get out in front of ourselves are actually perceived benefits. So what I would ask each of you that's listening in right now to think about is some of the, the patterns that may happen at night for you in terms of your mindset. Are you a worrier? Are you a planner? Are you someone who um, thinks about creative solutions to things? Are you someone that has a racing mind? Are you someone that likes to identify solutions? Whatever it is, what are the benefits to that, um, to what's going on there? right? Depending on what it is. It couldn't be very different, but most often we participate in things that we have perceived benefits from. So if there's no reason to do something, we stop doing it most of the time. And so this can be somewhat complicated with, with behaviors that are counterproductive to what we want, 
But again, a lot of times if you start to think about, okay, if I'm worrying about something, you know, maybe I'll feel more prepared. Maybe I'll think about other solutions, something like that. But again, it often comes down to some perceived benefit. All right, so we're gonna dive right into the different uh, thinking patterns. So I kind of have a format here of uh, what's going on, what, what that mindset is like, then the underlying belief, potentially, and the, uh, the practice that we can do to change this pattern. So the first one, especially because this presentation was named uh, Freedom from Frustration, is being frustrated irritable, upset, right? So this mindset is I can't sleep, this is ridiculous. Something similar to that, right? Something in the range of I should be able to sleep or why can't I sleep or getting upset. You know, for those of you that are listening in that this is a norm, you know exactly what I'm talking about. It's waking up in the middle of the night and being flustered, you know? So the underlying belief is I should be able uh, to sleep well each night, or I should be able to sleep better. You know, something is wrong with me. So to a certain degree, you want to realize that even good sleepers do not perfectly sleep through the night. You know, good sleepers sometimes get up, use the restroom, and yeah, most likely they are um, able to fall back asleep faster or fall asleep, you know, faster at night in general. But the key is to realize the frustration, the irritability, the upsetness, it is not helping. So, um, so the practice here in terms of what you can actually do, this, this may sound funny, I want you to get upset. So this is something that's, that's somewhat paradoxical, right? But, um, and you know, you can do this in the middle of the night or have the same thought ration, you know, kind of thing in the middle of the day. Get, get upset. Notice what is happening right then. See that it's kind, of, it's kind of silly if you think about it, you know? I mean, what, what are you getting upset over? Who are you going to get angry at? Or what are, and a lot of times, I, I'm, you know, on a more serious note, I know that that can be um, thrown more inward, right? Being upset with yourself. I should be able to do something else. I would, you know, give yourself some self-love. Realize, hey, this is something that is not helpful. I need to respond differently. So some other practices that can be helpful. Asking yourself, um, is getting upset helping me to sleep, right? Caring less about sleep as well. So this sounds kind of funny from a sleep doc to be telling you to care less about sleep. But one of the things that impacts people, uh, their ability to fall asleep is because we're so concerned with sleep to the point where it actually becomes a negative cycle that they can't fall asleep kind of thing. Um, so again, show yourself some love in this process. It is, it is not something that anyone is choosing to have difficulty falling asleep or staying asleep or waking too early, right? This is not a, a choice for you. So let's go into the next one. Planning for tomorrow, worrying for tomorrow. A very, very common one. So the, and when I'm talking about all these different thinking patterns, you know, a lot of times this can be when your head hits the pillow, but you know, it can be an hour beforehand, it can be in the middle of the night, whatever. So planning for tomorrow, worrying for tomorrow. The mindset is what do I need to do tomorrow? What can I improve upon? Uh, what do I need to be ready for? The underlying belief. If I don't think and prepare for tomorrow, it's not going to go as well. So I want to ask everyone, again, to think about this. If you're a planner or a worrier, is that necessarily true? This is one of the perceived benefits that goes with planning and worrying. We, we believe that somehow things are gonna go better. But you gotta to prove to yourself, and this isn't just me telling you, right? I want you to build the evidence for yourself over time that even days when in the middle, and this isn't to say that you completely shouldn't ever think about tomorrow or anything like that, but it's in the middle of the night, right? I mean, what are you gonna do? Nothing is gonna change at 3 a.m. compared to 6 a.m., you know? And the day is done, 
it should be for um, focusing on sleep, being relaxed instead of working things out. Um, so to get into the practice aspect of this, one of these pragmatic strategies, and this is somewhat of a, a common one, is a worry journal, right? So being able to identify um, different um, things that are going on that you may think about that night. So sitting down for five or 10 minutes and writing out, okay, you know what? Tonight, I know my pattern. I'm a worrier. I'm a planner, right? What am I going to think about? What do I have some control over, right? What can I do about this? We can't control most things in the external world, but we have some control on how we respond, what we do, right? So if we can write out what's going on, um, things that we can specifically do, that can be a helpful practice because in the middle of the night or at the beginning of the night, you can basically tell yourself, I have already done this. The perceived benefit does not exist anymore. Uh, so another thing that you can do is asking yourself, is it actually imperative that I prepare? Right? Has there been a day when I haven't done this and then, you know what, things didn't go too bad. It actually went okay. Right? This is the evidence you want to start building to prove to yourself. Um, ask yourself, how many times have I been able to handle changes? That kind of thing. So those are some of the aspects of practice for, um, for that thinking pattern. The next one, uh, thinking over the previous day. So the mindset is what happened today? What did I do today? What, what um, transpired, so to speak? You know, the underlying belief is I need to learn from today, right? What went right, what went wrong, what, what um, you know, analyzing social situations or thinking about, oh, this went well, or whatever. Um, it's a lot of focusing on the day. So again, a lot of these patterns are not necessarily bad to do in general, but it's when we are focusing in on this stuff, when our head hits the pillow, it's stimulating our brain, it's activating our mind, and it's harder to fall asleep when that's going on. So some things to do in terms of practice for thinking over the previous day, um, realizing that what happened, happened, you are gonna move forward, whether you want to or not. <laughs> Everybody wakes up the next day, so to speak. We don't ever go backwards. We can't ever relive that day. So realizing what happened, happened. You know, and there's a, um, there's a saying, um, this morning is just as over as 50 years ago, right? So the past is the past and having some sense of acceptance with that. Um, you know, basically this comes down to deciding what you do with the time that is given to you. So just like you can be more aware, be more present and mindful during the day, you also need to realize that at night, you know, this is one of those things you want to be cognizant of how you're spending your time, you know, so being in a place where you're relaxing as opposed to going over every single thing. So practicing relaxation over um, analyzation. <laughs> it's a word I, um, I'm not sure if that exists, but it's basically like looking over every tiny little, you know, thing during the day. All right, so next up. Creative solutions. This is one I, I hear from time to time that the uh, bedtime is one of those uh, free spaces of time during someone's day. This is a lot of times the, the people that are super busy and so they utilize instead of time for sleep, it is time to figure out X, Y, and Z, right? Oh, I can um, work on a project or I can figure out how to fix something in the house or I can figure out how to help my friend or whatever, right? So the mindset is what can I use my mind to solve now? And the underlying belief, it's more important to solve problems than to relax and sleep. And the underlying belief, with all of these underlying beliefs, you wanna question these. Is that absolutely true, right? So to a certain degree, you may be able to solve um, something, you know? If you're up for eight hours in the middle of the night thinking about things, yeah, you'll probably figure something out. And yet, what's the con to that, right? Being 
a lot more tired the next day. Um, so it's kind of one of those things where you got to have to, you got to make this, this, um, an agreement with yourself that, Hey, if I set aside time to be creative during the day, then, Hey, maybe that will substitute for the time in the middle of the night. So, um, I kind of just went into one of these practice aspects, um, dedicating time towards the beginning of the day or the middle of the day, or even the end of the day, creative solutions, um, having acceptance, being in a place where you realize, okay, pro and con analysis, accept it is what it is. Sleep is more important than X, Y, or Z. Um, and to another degree, if you really, really want to be creative or utilize your dream or whatever, put a pad of paper next to your bed in the morning. If you are one of those people who feels like you, you know, your dreams are really creative or something's going to help, you know, just write it out in the morning. But I will say, definitely do not do that in the middle of the night. So if it's the middle of the night, you don't want to get in that habit. But when you're fi your final awakening, you know, then spend some time to just jot it out what you were thinking about, right? If that's something you really, really wanted to do. So next up, anxiety about sleeping. A lot of people feel this, this uh, surge of anxiety or uncomfortableness that is very low at the beginning of the day and starts to get worse and worse throughout the day. And it's because of this sense of like this autopilot in the back of our minds of Sleep is not going to work. It's going to not going to go as well, all that kind of stuff. You know? So the mindset for anxiety about sleeping is often it's going to be another one of those nights. And the underlying belief is if I don't sleep well, tomorrow is going to be terrible. And again, you know, you may have with all of these underlying beliefs or exact mindset, you know, it may be a little different. But a lot of times, this is kind of what I hear with people that I'm working with on these, on these things. So um, let me repeat. If I don't sleep well, tomorrow is going to be terrible. This underlying belief, is that necessarily true? So I guess as a blanket statement, you can say, if I don't sleep as well, more often, you know, you may be more tired. You may be more sleepy. But does that mean catastrophe. If you can't sleep well, then does that mean tomorrow is going to be terrible? What I would say is most often, no. One of the things you need to realize is that even if you don't sleep well, you can still enjoy life the next day. You know, one of the interesting things is that when I work with people, and this is the very thing that's going on, uh, a lot of times they'll say, well, you know, yeah, usually when I don't sleep well, it's not a catastrophe the next day, right? I mean, the world doesn't end. I get through the day. To a certain degree, it may even suck a little bit. And yet, if you tell yourself at night, if I don't sleep well, you know, it's going to suck tomorrow, but I'll get through it. I always do, right? That's a very different way of approaching it and maybe potentially even a somewhat more pessimistic way than you know, you, then you could, but it's a very, it's a better way of looking at it than just telling yourself it's going to be terrible tomorrow. Nothing's going to work. It's going to, you know, X, Y, or Z. It's realizing the realistic side of this. This is the evidence side of things, right? So um, the practice component of uh, if you have anxiety about sleeping, because that is the, you know, the anxiety about sleeping actually can be worse than than the normal pattern of being able to sleep, any, all that kind of stuff. So in terms of things that you want to try out, you want to question yourself a bit. How much pressure am I putting on myself, right? Ultimately, that's, that's a certain degree. Usually when someone has nothing to do the next day, they're not really feeling that much anxiety because they're saying, oh, well, if I feel that bad, I can just you know, sleep in or do something else or, or whatever. So notice a connection there. It's often based on some kind of performance, you know, standard. Um, so how much pressure am I putting on myself? Am I telling myself this is going to be terrible? Does not sleeping well equal worst day ever? Um, is it possible to still enjoy different aspects of, of life tomorrow, even if I am tired? 
So really, that's an important part of this, realizing, okay, you know, it's not so um, all or nothing here. It's not so complete disaster or feeling wonderful and great day. No, usually it's kind of a spectrum. There's usually days where we're tired and they're good days. Some days we get a good night of sleep and it's not a great day. So it's not always based on sleep. All right, so next up, a racing mind. A racing mind can be any of the stuff above that we talked about. Um, it can be other things as well, or sometimes I work with people when, when they're saying, you know, I just, my mind is just active, right? I'm not even anxious, I'm not concerned, I'm not worried. Um, and the thing is, our mind can get uh, used to being activated. It can, if you're one of those people that's go, 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 to a certain degree, yeah, it would make sense where, you know, you're going to sleep. Sometimes people are able to naturally create this um, process where they get more tired and they start to lull their mind, it, like they start to calm their mind, um, but that's not always the case. Sometimes the mind is just, it's always one speed, 100%, um, 100 miles per hour. So the mindset for a racing mind is often thinking, 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 right? It's kind of, um, I wish I had a, like a squirrel emoji of <laughs> like, you know, or a dog, sorry, a dog emoji or whatever of like squirrel kind of thing. That's where our mind kind of goes when we have a racing mind. It's always on the next thing. The underlying belief is lots going on, lots to think about, lots to do, right? Usually we're not um, in a place where we're sitting back, you know, relaxing. Usually you're not ever, you don't ever find yourself on a beach chair on a, you know, in the sand on a beach and your mind is going up, you know, boom, 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 boom. There's, we're thinking, there's this notion of there's stuff going on. I got to think about it. I got to do things, whatever. So some practice tips for this thinking pattern. Diaphragmatic breathing. So this is often known as belly breathing, boxed breathing, whatever. But it's important to um, be using the diaphragm. That's where the diaphragmatic aspect most likely is coming from. Um, if we are breathing through the 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 belly, the diaphragm here, as opposed to up here, um, we are lulling the body. So without getting too much into the, uh, the physiological component of it, deep breathing is very important. It's a very, um, it's a very powerful ally that we can have. Um, thought identification is also a very good strategy for this pattern. So realizing, okay, I am having the thought that blank. Right? And so there's a lot of um, more deeper seated ways of going through these mindfulness practices. I'm kind of just going through them real quickly. But if you're in a place where it's like thought, 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 we want to, we want to be able to transition to thought, I'm having this thought, okay. I'm letting it go, so to speak. I'm having another thought. I'm letting it go. I'm having another thought. I'm letting it go. So it, it's able to slow the thoughts down as opposed to so many back back and forth and all of that. We want to become an observer of our thoughts instead of tied to all of these different kinds of thoughts. And I know to a certain degree this is somewhat um, a bit abstract and metaphysical and that kind of thing. And yet, you know, this is one of those things, the more you practice, the more you slow down this process, the more you realize the control you have in this process, the better. So um, let's go to some specific, positive, helpful mindsets. Um, and I kind of come, come up with these over the last few days from working with a lot of people and identifying some of the helpful ways of looking through this. So the first one I call spectrum thinking. So realizing that everything is on a spectrum, right? In terms of that, that um, anxiety about tomorrow kind of thing, I was saying, you know, either you're here, whether it's a lot of times people will think, okay, I don't get enough sleep, it's going to be a terrible day. Or I do get enough sleep, it's going to be an awesome day. You know, yeah, that's not really always the case. Realize sometimes you get sleep and it's not a great day. Sometimes you don't get that much sleep and it is a great day. So a lot of times you got to look at the, the spectrum in between. Uh, we want to be flexible 
in how we're thinking about things. Uh, the saber tooth kitty thinking strategy. So this is probably my coolest named mindset, I'd like to say. But basically, we want to think about if we are creating a saber tooth tiger, so to speak, when the problem is more like a house cat. So problem at work, problem at home, you know, start to look at this and say, okay, how difficult am I rating this? You know, at a scale of one to a hundred, you know, if you're feeling or you're thinking that this problem is a 70 out of 100, it's super, it's a giant thing. What are you going to tell yourself in six months? Right? So if you were to tell yourself in six months, no, nah, maybe it's a three out of 10 instead of a seven out of 10 then what well, you got to realize what you're doing is creating a bigger problem than um, what you're actually going through. And that can actually make this situation worse. So just something to think about there. Um, I got this thinking. So you want to be confident in your ability to handle the next day, regardless of how much sleep you get or what happens. So again, this isn't only a mindset. You want to realize, okay, I have gone through so many days and I have been able to handle some things, if not most things, right? Realize and have that confidence because that can help you to decrease the anxiety, the worry about sleep in general, you know, realize that your life is not going to be perfect and yet, you know, it can still be somewhat good. The next one here, um, Oh, I put um, realize, basically, this is, this is talking about you, you are never 100% prepared. So in this, I got this thinking paradigm here, you know, regardless of how much you're thinking about something, worrying about something, thinking about it at night, whatever, you're still not 100% prepared ever. There are curveballs that always happen in life, right? It's based on being in the moment, you know, being in a place where you are responding it to it in the best way. That's where we want to get to. That's what you want to realize. It's not about the preparation always. It's about being in a place where, okay, if I'm calm, if I'm relaxed, if I have a different way of looking at this in place, it can be more helpful. Uh, flow of water thinking is all about being flexible. Realize that you can adapt, you can change. So again, we want to be able to flow like water. Think of a stream. There's a big boulder in front. What does water do? It moves to the sides and then it comes back, right? We want to have this sense of, okay, obstacle, something comes up. I'm going to adopt a different approach, change things up, respond differently. And finally here, the shoulder shrug thinking. Life would be better for most people if we just learn to shrug our shoulders. And I mean that seriously. I mean, think about it. Most of the problems, issues that people are having, <laughs> I mean, to a certain degree, what are you going to do, right? You can, you can um, try things out in a different way. You can respond differently. For most problems, you want to be able to get to a point where you honestly are able to shrug your shoulders and say, I'm going to do the best I can, right? I'm going to focus on um, new options, whether that's working with somebody, whether that's, you know, trying something new, whatever it is, right? But it's, it's being able to not be so rigid and so attached and so uh, perfectionistic in those kinds of thinking patterns. So some other general um, helpful uh, tips here. Uh, you know, I've talked about a lot of these in other webinars a lot, so, but they're so important. I just wanted to touch on them in case anyone is a brand new one here. So adding regularity to your sleep times, um, following good uh, sleep hygiene, you know, a lot of the, you know, don't, um, you know, drink caffeine later at night, don't have stimulants, whether it's smoking, chewing, whether it's, you know, all of that kind of stuff. Um, responding differently is so important. Uh, and I'd like to mention the regularity. It's not only for the weekdays, by the way, kind of made me think a second. It is definitely for the weekends as well. If the weekdays you're, you have certain times, all that, and then on the weekends it's completely off, it's going to impact you the next week, you know, the next Monday or whatever. So weekdays, weekends, similar bed and wake times. Um, 
with all of this stuff, it's never 100% certainty in life for most things, right? And it's the same thing with this pattern. All these new mindsets, you wanna give it a shot, see some results, um, have a sense of acceptance when going to bed. You know, the day is done. That's all you can do for that day, right? Leaving it at the door, so to speak. Um, and again, this, the, the worry journal, the writing things out prior to bed, again, that's a simple, somewhat pragmatic um, approach here. So let me uh, switch back. Let me switch back to Zoom. Let's see if there are any questions. If anybody has any, so let me pull this up. All right. Um, ah, Q&A about weighted blankets. Okay. Um, interesting. I, I would say... Um, I, to be honest, off the top of my head, I don't have any specific research or literature to say yay or nay on weighted blankets. I think it basically will depend on what's going on as well. Um, so if there's, there's something going on from a physiological side of things, that may be good to chat with one of your providers and, and honestly see if something else is going on. But from my own anecdotal experience um, in working with patients over the years and this kind of stuff, you know, honestly, sometimes people will say weighted blankets are great. Honestly, sometimes people will say, I used to use a weighted blanket, but I got too hot, you know? So it's kind of one of those things where, honestly, your subjective experience is going to be probably the most important part of this and realizing that if it works for you, great. If not, so I would, I would give it a couple days, ultimately. But also realize that you do want to be a little bit cold when going to sleep as opposed to being warm. So the bedroom in general, dark, cool, and quiet. So the temperature, um, and it, you know, as Phoenicians, that kind of thing, we're, we're used to hotter temperatures outside. So someone from Canada may need to have their temperature a little bit cooler to feel cool. But uh, the, the saying goes that you want to be able to get up out of bed if you're ever to need to use the restroom in the middle of the night and um, feel just a little bit cold, right? And then once you get into bed with your covers, then you feel kind of snug. So just another tip for the weighted blankets. Um, all right, so next up, any tips on falling back to sleep? Uh, yes, so I would say, um, you know, and it, it, I'm not sure if um, you're, one of those individuals that was coming on a little bit later or you're able to um, be here through the whole talk. But I would say, especially if, if not, identify some of the patterns in terms of your mindset, what's going on in terms of your mindset and um, practicing out some of the tips that were discussed. So in terms of breathing techniques, yes, that was the diaphragmatic breathing component, where it's really important to breathe through the stomach as opposed to the, uh, the chest. So breathing through the stomach to a certain degree is stimulating the parasympathetic nervous system, basically. Um, that is kind of our calm response. It's helping the body to relax. When the body's more relaxed, the, uh, the mind can be more relaxed. But you know, I think it is an important part, it's kind of an asterisk to this, this talk that you know, mindset issues are not always the only thing that's impacting people from being able to, to fall asleep. So it, you know, it may just be the case that someone is on here and, um, you know, their body is used to waking up or their body is in, you know, has a circadian rhythm disorder or something else going on as well. So again, that, you know, there could be different things going on, but in general, um, yes, I always recommend deep breathing. It can always be one of those things in our back pocket. And um, another side note, if you're one of those people that wears a CPAP or a mask, the boxed breathing approach, if you were to look it up, would basically say, you know, breathing in, holding, breathing out, holding. You want to be somewhat careful about that because that might throw off the um, CPAP <laughs> a little bit. But you can still breathe in normally, but make sure it's deep breathing through the stomach um, and then breathing out. All right, so I see on here, um, an option on or opinion on melatonin. So, you know, you know, and again, 
so being a psychologist, my, my background, my forte is not in sleep aids and, and medications and that kind of thing. Um, but in general, again, melatonin can be something that's helpful. You know, it's a naturally occurring hormone in our body. Um, for some people, they report it to be um, somewhat helpful. Others, not as much. So especially since that is an over-the-counter um, sleep aid, you know, to some degree, if it's something that you want to try out, I, I will say the research uh, often points to a small amount is enough. So I know that they um, sell melatonin up to like 10 milligrams in gummies and pills, that kind of thing. But the, the research points to usually like even up to just one milligram can be um, beneficial. All right, next up, blue light blocking glasses for watching TV. What I would say, um, if it's earlier on in the night, Yes, that could be helpful because yes, there is that, that um, aspect going on, but especially later in the night, I would just not watch TV. And I know for some people you may have to, um, that you may cringe a little bit, <laughs> but the last hour of the night, you should not be watching TV. You should not be on electronics, whether that is a laptop, phone, TV, work, emails, especially work, I would say. You know, but so really give yourself a wind down period that last hour. All right, um, last one here. I, I see I have a problem relaxing going back to sleep with my uh, med air. So, you know, definitely one of those things that you'd want to check in and identify if there's something going on with the machine. Um, yet, you know, if you know you're one of those people that you know, um, wearing a mask can be somewhat difficult, then yeah, the anxiety side of things may be playing into this. So think about it. We're all used to breathing our own air, right? For the most part. So it is kind of a weird, strange sensation. So to a certain degree, um, that could be playing into this. So different sensations and being able to get somewhat sensitized to this kind of thing. So even wearing this during the day and having kind of normalized in the middle of the night or to be honest that you know there could be other things going on in the middle of the night sometimes what keeps us up is not what's um uh, no i'm sorry what's the saying that what what wakes us up is not always what uh, keeps us up it could be different uh so i see here some more thoughts um so sleep before midnight is better versus sleep uh, versus after midnight so that is somewhat of a complicated question because something um, that's known as our circadian rhythm, so basically our internal clock, determines what is the best time for sleep. So that can change. We can alter our circadian rhythm. So um, basically, though, circadian rhythms are impacted by light exposure. So for someone who's kind of on a normal um, circadian rhythm pattern, right? So this like 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. kind of thing. Then um, to a certain degree, you may be staying up past when your body would normally be, you know, sleeping. However, there are people that have what's called advanced sleep phases. They go, they're the early birds. They go to sleep early in the um, evening and they stay up until, or they wake up um, early, you know, in the morning. So this is kind of like the 7 p.m. to 2 or 3 a.m. risers. On the other side of things, there's delayed sleep phase. These are the night owls. I'm actually one of these people. My natural circadian rhythm is based on, um, you know, being more of a night owl. So, um, and, and this is kind of getting back to this question of is sleeping uh, before midnight better than sleeping after midnight? For someone who's, who's like me and our natural circadian rhythm is um, a bit delayed, yeah, it's more, it's, I, I'm, it's, I'm more inclined to sleep well a little bit later on. So technically, the sleep we're getting is not, if you have quote unquote delayed sleep phase or advanced sleep phase, the amount of hours or the time you're getting isn't necessarily worse or better. Um, you know, like if it's before or after, it just, it depends on the person, to be honest, because if someone has an advanced sleep phase, their their body is used to going to sleep much earlier, but then they go to sleep at 2 a.m. instead of that's when they'd usually be
be getting up, yeah, it's going to be lower quality of sleep. So, you know, there's a little background on that. Uh, sound machines, I saw that as well. Yeah, so sound machines definitely can be helpful. For the most part, I mean, soothing kinds of, you know, some people, um, you know, listen to music, other people listen to whooshing, wind, all that kind of stuff. Um, but to a certain degree, yeah, sound machines, you know, for the most part are helpful. Naps during the day, I would say uh, don't take naps during the day. So there are some exceptions to this rule. Um, so those that uh, have been diagnosed with narcolepsy uh, or something like that, obviously that may be a little different. Um, but, you know, naps, you can kind of think of it as lowering our sleep drive. It's stealing sleep from the middle of the night. So, you know, with all the stuff that I'm talking about, a lot of times there's, there's some specifics and ways you want to structure this stuff. So it can be different for everyone. But if you think about naps during the day, um, yeah, if you're one of those people that takes a while to fall asleep or you have a bunch of awakenings in the middle of the night, kind of think of as like a time frame of 24 hours. And if you're sleeping through this portion and then you sleep a little bit over here, it's kind of like this portion here, you're stealing sleep from here and you're sleeping here. The body doesn't really need to change if you, know, you have a time when you're able to sleep. So it lowers our sleep drive, it makes it more difficult to sleep. Uh, light or aromatherapy recommendations. Um, I don't have any aromatherapy recommendations, to be honest. Uh, and I'm not sure in terms of uh, what light, do you have a, um, a follow-up in terms of what, what you mean by a light recommendation? Let me see here if, um, ah, like a relaxing light, okay. Um, you know, so towards the end of the night, um, it's one of those things where, oh, I lost my, uh, lost my chat function. Hold on, let me pull that back up. Oh no, I lost the, uh, well, let me, I'll, I'll just, so basically, um, you want to really be cognizant of light exposure. So lots of light in the morning, right? And as you go through the day, reducing light exposure, that can be somewhat helpful. Um, all right. So I apologize. I, uh, the other chat function has gone away here, but I, I do see a, a Q and A that, that popped up and someone asked about, um, if I could explain spectrum thinking one more time. So, yes, so spectrum thinking, you wanna think of this as most things in life are not all or nothing, right? So especially with sleep, because this is one of the most common things I hear. People will think something to the degree of, okay, if I get a poor night's sleep, then um, I am going to not have a good day tomorrow. So let's think of that as this, this aspect here. Right, this is gonna be the terrible, it's not gonna be a good day. If I get a good night of sleep, it's gonna be over here. I'm gonna be in the good, the good night, the good, um, it's gonna work out well. But think about it. Not every day that you have a good night of sleep do you have a good day. Sometimes it's here, sometimes it's here, sometimes it's here, 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 right? This is the spectrum aspect of it. Um, and not every day that you have a bad night of sleep is it gonna be a bad day, right? So some days it's here, some days it's here, some days it's here. Some days you have a really good day, even though you're tired or fatigued. So this is the spectrum that you wanna think about. And honestly, this can go in so many different ways because you, know, you, can, you can start putting this out to other situations like work difficulties or whatever. You know, If I have to do this, this thing that I don't like to do, how terrible is it gonna be, right? Is it gonna be this terrible? And if I don't have to do it, I'm gonna, it's gonna be that off, you know? So starting to put a spectrum on things as opposed to this all or nothing kind of um, emphasis. Uh, all right, so the tryptophan type foods. Um, well, to be honest, I don't know, and I, I can't give any recommendations on if that is something that actually um, is beneficial as something to do each night. I mean, clearly everyone knows about, you know, like the, the turkey tryptophan crash and all that, you know, kind of thing. What I would say is it's more important to focus in on 
good sleep hygiene, doing the right things, regularity with sleep, being more aware of mindsets and the impact of that kind of stuff, as opposed to trying to, you know, get the perfect like sleep aid kind of thing night after night. Because clearly that can impact things, um, you know, later on. So, well, uh, I don't see any more questions on here. Oh, I see. Um, Oh, uh, just a follow-up to the relaxing light. I, I um, saw that on here. It's so funny. I have two different chat functions. This Zoom is amazing. Um, but it's, if you can't sleep at night and you're exhausted the next day in terms of waking you up, I'm assuming. Um, so that's, that's somewhat of a complicated question because, yeah, you do want light exposure. And to a certain degree, yeah, that is, that is triggering the circadian rhythms to say, okay, this is daytime, this is, I should be awake, all of that kind of um, thing. But again, you know, there's, there's different aspects to this. So, all right, let me tune back here and see. Um, yes, so I don't think we have any more. Uh, <laughs> we do have one more question. All right, so one more question real quick. So can you catch up on sleep debt? Um, well, so sleep debt is real to a certain degree, and I think it's important to explain because a lot of people think, um, and I, I was just talking with someone about this today in terms of, of sleep debt, they think that it's like something that they've carried along their whole life from a time period before. So I, I always like to phrase it like this, you know, if, if you have a bunch of pets or a bunch of children, right? And during the week, they didn't really eat that well. They didn't have enough food. We're in a, a starvation kind of situation, something, you know, really terrible like that. Would you give them seven times more food on, you know, Saturday and Sunday or whatever? The answer is probably no, right? So to a certain degree, obviously, we know if we're really tired, it can, it can impact us the next day and the next day. Again, as our, as our sleep drive increases, you know, we can be in a place where um, we become tireder and tireder. Uh, to a certain degree, though, it's, it's important to realize this isn't something that you always carry with you. or some, it's, some people kind of like think of it as like a big bag of sleep debt on their shoulders. So clearly, in, in terms of longitudinal res research, yes, sleep can negatively impact various health outcomes, you know, but it's one of those things where you want to think of it kind of more so as, as food to a certain degree as, you know, you wouldn't, you wouldn't need seven times more like one day in order to catch up or get enough sleep, you know, to, to even the scale, so to speak. So, um, yes, I think we are um, about out of time. I don't see any other um, questions here. So definitely appreciate everyone tuning in. If there's anything that, um, I can be of service, you know, please let me know. So uh, obviously I'm one of the providers at Valley Sleep Center. You can go to the, the website and uh, click on there. We do have um, telehealth uh, available right now. So hopefully this was um, informative for everybody. Uh, again, thank you for uh, tuning in. Uh, until next time, everyone, sleep well.